Starting a new job is never easy. As part of the P10 and Motor Age Best Young Tech Award program, I'm speaking to industry experts today to get their advice on how young techs can succeed on the job. You'll hear tips from success for that very first day onward, how you can get on the promotion fast track, and what common challenges you might encounter in the shop and how to overcome those plus some advice on soft skills that you need in your shop. I'm Amanda Siliker, the editor of P10, and joining me today on the panel is Bogey Latiner of All Girls Garage, Jake Onanen of Wrenchway, Mike Presendo of the Tech Force Foundation, and Anthony Williams of CarQuest Technical Institute. Thank you all for joining me. Great, thanks for having us. So before we start, I just want to mention to everyone out there watching that you can enter a comment or a question for the panel on whatever social platform you're watching us on. They'll pop up here, I'll see them, and then we will ask them at the end of our session. Also, if you're a young tech under the age of 35 who is doing an exceptional job, or if you know a young tech who is, I definitely want to encourage you to nominate them for our Best Young Tech Award. That's brought to you by P10 and Motor Age magazines and nominations are officially open as of today. So you can get that application form at vehicleservicepros.com slash 2022 best young tech. So I'm gonna jump right in here. Let's start this conversation by really focusing on those young techs who are just graduating. What skills are shops looking for when they're hiring? And you know, Jay, I think with your experience, this would be a great question to start with you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's funny because right now, every shop, it feels like is needing a technician, right? So when they see a young technician that shows interest, I'll joke that it's, you know, what they're really interested in is a warm body. But realistically, what they want is, is attitude and aptitude, right? Somebody that has that really good attitude, uh, that shows up to work on time, listens to direction, and maybe has a base set of skills, but not necessarily uh, fully trained, right? A lot of shops like to grow their own. They like to uh, put them through their own training and really kind of set the tone for what their career is going to look like at that shop. So uh, for, for me, the biggest piece is that attitude side. Uh, we can teach the aptitude or as long as they have some form of mechanical ability, uh, I, I think there's a lot that can go into that. Now, basic electrical diagnostics, every time I'm in an advisory committee meeting, it seems like every shop's asking <clears throat> for more electrical, more electrical. Obviously, there's going to be more pressure on that as we move forward. Uh, but uh, I think the biggest piece is that attitude and coming in ready to work and uh, ready to learn because that's a that's a great foundational tool for what you're going to have in the rest of your career. Yeah, I'd, I'd add to that when I'm interviewing apprentices or entry level technicians, I'm I'm looking for how well they play with others, right? Yeah. Um, I'm looking for honesty. If you don't know a heck of a lot, don't tell me that you do, right? I would rather know that you know nothing, but you're eager to learn and you're eager to to get in there and get dirty and learn stuff as you go. You know, as Jay said, I can I can teach you how to turn a wrench. I I cannot teach you how to care. And so I'm looking for somebody who's passionate about getting into this industry and is willing to be honest, willing to work with others and is teachable first and foremost. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. And those are actually those are actually great traits that I think are forgotten when uh, we're teaching inside the high schools and colleges is that <clears throat> sometimes we focus so hard on the wrench turning ability, the ability to use tools um, that we forget about, hey, let's find out whether they have an aptitude for this job. You know, um, I think aptitude is one of the things that are that's overlooked quite often. And sometimes we need to remember that not everybody has the skill and ability to be a technician. Like it's not only mental, there's a physical agility as well for it. So yeah, keeping mm -hmm. those things in mind and being honest with yourself. There's a lot of jobs in the automotive career, not just technicians. Um, mm -hmm. So just know there's always a home for you somewhere. Yes. Well, and on that, I remember talking to a shop who uh, hired a, a young person who had their technical degree, but quite frankly, just didn't have the aptitude. But they had the attitude. They liked, they, this was a keeper, but after trying with, with this person for months, they, they clearly just, even though they had the certification and they had their degree, they, that's just, they just didn't have the knack for it. But they, they were passionate about it and they were great with customers. So they kept them and just found a better place for them. 
Mike, you know what's funny is that that was my story, right? I grew up in. Well, I didn't shop. want to out you. I didn't want yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was actually it was actually <laughs> me. The whole time. It was actually me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I grew up in a shop and and always assumed that I would be able to do those things that I saw being done every day. And went off to tech school, came back, and wasn't good at it, right? Like I I really sucked uh, it, <laughs> to be frank. So uh, being able to find my right fit within the industry was really really important. And I think it gives you a different level of respect for technicians and those young technicians that can come out and do it right away. I do. I do want to say, however, that not all shops are equally set up for training new people. Yes. They may want to, but they may not be good teachers. And so, yes, be honest with yourself. Is it that I don't know how to, you know, which end of the screwdriver to hold? Is it my aptitude or is it the place that I'm at not giving me space to grow and giving me the, the tools to learn? And don't be afraid to go somewhere else. Like when you're interviewing you're interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing you. Is this a good fit for you? Is this a place where you can learn? Do you like the people who you're going to be working with? Do you feel like you communicate with them? So that's important too. Oh, that's yeah. such a good point. Yeah. And, and sorry, I'll just, just to continue on that for a second, Bogey, is there ever like an opportunity to, I don't know, test it out for the day or like maybe kind of have lunch with some of the current technicians at the shop? Like how else can, you know, I know if I just graduated, if that's a good spot for me? Yeah, you know, I think it's being willing to ask, right? Can can I take a tour of the shop? Can I speak with some of your current technicians? I'd like to know who I'm going to be working with. Again, you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you. At my shop personally, we always had a half day of working interview and it was great for the tech to know if they were a fit. And it was great for me to see, do you just interview well? Or are you more interested in hanging out and talking? Are you just gonna stand there and hold a toolbox down? Or are you really curious and eager, like the right tech or the right apprentice tech is gonna be in there looking at what's going on, asking questions, um, really excited to be out there. So it's a little bit of a two way street, but if they don't offer that, ask for it. Can I come out for free? Can I come spend half a day or a couple of hours in the shop just checking it out, make sure it's the right place for me? I think most well, employers think, will appreciate that. And I think it's important too. I've seen some folks might have a bad experience at a particular shop or, or even with a brand and just assume they're all that way. I I, I, I met a, a, a actually a woman we profiled on our Women Tech's Rock stuff and she was with a shop, brand unnamed, and, and was having a, te a terrible time. She They paid for her school, so she was kind of indebted to them and had a contract to work with them and just and was ready to throw in the towel completely on the whole career path because she was having a bad experience, bad management and stuff, and kind of associating it with that, that master brand. Mm -hmm. yeah. She went to another dealership, same brand, totally restored her faith in the career. She's totally passionate and engaged. So it's, it you know, don't be afraid to, to, to move on but also don't cast the whole sector or a particular brand. You know, it, people are different from shop to shop and, and it, you know, it could be a, a, a great play, you know, go across the street and might be, you know, go across town, same brand. They might be totally different. And that's to me, one of the biggest things or biggest pieces of advice I give to young techs is don't just go for the money, right? Like use those early years as educational, and figure out where your fit is. Because if you can get in with somebody that is a good mentor to you and does have a good training program and you feel comfortable with them, I think feeling comfortable with that, that leadership team is so important because that allows you to be able to ask questions and, and really be curious. If somebody's just banging on your head to, to try and get hours out you know, with a young tech, it's probably not gonna end well for you. So. Uh, be, you know, don't take the highest dollar amount, figure out where your comfort zone is. And, and uh, hopefully when you find that shop, it should give you more ability to have a successful career. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. That That's great, you guys. I really appreciate those comments. Now let's just slowly kind of shift a little bit into, you know, they just started their job, you know, maybe they've been there for a week or maybe they've been there for three months or, you know, just, just however long they still feel pretty new. So what are some you know tips there for how those newer techs can succeed on the job? Um, Bogey, did you wanna start us off on that one? Yeah, my number one thing I tell all new hires, whether they're an apprentice or a master tech, don't let your ego get in the way of your intelligence. 
right? Be honest, be humble. You may have had the most incredible schooling. You may have done a whole ton of stuff in your home garage, but it's very different once you get into the shop and, and people appreciate the honesty. I don't know this, but I'm really excited to learn it. Don't say you know something if you don't. Um, the other thing I would say is stay curious. Want to understand how things come apart. Want to understand how things work. Always be asking questions and show that eagerness to the people that you're working with. They are more likely to take you under their wing and want to mentor you and want to raise you up and teach you things if they feel like you are genuinely you know, interested and passionate about it. Um, and then the third thing I would say is don't start like totally feeling like you have to spend all of the money on tools right off the bat. 100%. Basic set of tools is like really all you kind of need to begin with. And then my my rule has always been, especially when I was coming up, if I have to borrow it more than twice, I go buy it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, really. That's a good tip. Yeah. Hey, Bogey, you, you touched on a word that's uh, that's always been big for when I teach when I was teaching in the high school. And it goes along with Matt Fen Fanslow's uh, comment about work ethic. Um, there comes times, especially for the new guy in the shop that, you know, you're you're waiting to do the next thing. There's not there's not something directly ahead of you to do right now. And everybody's busy. Everybody's shuffling. Everybody's doing their thing. And you're you're stuck in this like waiting pattern. Um, and one of the things in my classroom is I never allowed students to just sit wait for me I'm, i've got to be with other students i've got to answer other questions what do you do in that that time and that 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 moment where there's nothing for you to do um and i always tell them grab a broom grab a broom and it goes back to your humble like okay yeah you went to school yeah you got all this debt about you know you getting your ases and go into this cool tech school but there's a moment where you're waiting for something and you grab that broom and you help another technician by cleaning up that kitty litter for him but when you do that you're also creating a bond with your fellow colleagues inside the garage so that they're like hey you know what i really like this guy you know he was, he was helpful i didn't even ask him to do it and he was able to help mm -hmm. me out they may be a lot more likely when you're down and they see that you've got nothing to do to say, hey, come here real quick. You can give me a hand. And there opens the door for you to come and learn and shadow while you're still on the job and you have those down moments. So That's my always advice to you guys, yeah, go grab a broom. Go grab a broom. Well, and, and I, I was at a table with a bunch of shop owners last week and we were talking about that and, and something that I think uh, particularly our, our younger viewers to, to fight the urge to go here. Mm, um, yes. They were all they were all <laughs> complaining about young people in their shop that when they were done with the project, instead of grabbing the broom or offering to help, they're on their phone. And uh, every one of the shop owners was was griping about it. It's a natural instinct. If you're if you're 20 years old, you live on this thing. Uh, but recognize that, you know, you're there to work. And unless you're looking something up for the job, you, you know, if, if you want to go far, I, I can't I can't agree enough that humility and willing to help with whatever needs to be done. But got my job done. I'm going to surf the web. Yeah. And that's so good. Preach it. Yes. Please, please <laughs> avoid the temptation to start getting into like the YouTube world and the social media world where you're documenting everything that you do. Like you're getting paid to get an education in the very early years of your job. You are getting paid to get an education. Like how mm -hmm. cool is that? It is not the time to be social mediaing and doing YouTubes of the work that you're doing. It's not. It's not okay. You know, I've always had those questions. There's a couple of uh, TikTokers that I follow that they do some really cool stuff on TikTok. A um, couple like you know, quick transitioning break jobs and things that they come across, and it always gets in my head and go, "Who's paying for that time?" Because there was no like shop mentioned, so I don't know what shop they work for. Um, their shirts weren't like overly branded, so it wasn't that they were doing it to promote their shop. I was purely promoting themselves, which isn't, I mean, I, that, that's got its own place as well, but it does make me think like when you're doing that, you're still slowing down a little bit because that's an additional couple of minutes of, of, of tracking yourself, making those videos. So mm -hmm. I, I would definitely push, especially for new techs. I'm not going to just say young techs because I've walked into a lot of shops where guys 30, 40, 50 years old are on their phone. It's, you know, Mike, I'm going to push back on the 20 year olds. Not all of them are on their phones. Um, and they're, I forget now. And I, I it boggles my mind that I, that I forgot who gave, they gave a um, presentation about uh, millennials and, and Zen or Zennials and the new X generation. And 
they actually had slides up there talking about, you know, like this generation is the laziest generation or this generation doesn't care about anybody. This generation only looks for themselves. And people were having in the audience had to guess what generation was being talked about. Um, and none of it was about the younger generations. There's there are newspaper clips clippings from 1950s, 1960s, 1970s. Oh. So, yeah, I, I fight yeah. with following that same pattern that we get into because, you know, our our generation was talked about by the older generations, but so was theirs. Um, and, right. and the phone is, oh, man, that is the biggest distraction for everybody. And mm -hmm. it is a tool. I. I get frustrated when people are like, oh, I ban cell phones from my garage and my techs can't use cell phones at all. I'm like, wow, you took away an entire toolbox. Like there's so much you could do with it. But in the classroom, it's the same way. You get teachers that are like, there's no cell phones allowed in here. And I I, I, I try to fight back with, uh, if you ever think you know more than that, than the information that's available on that cell phone, then you need to get out of your position. But on the same point, if you give a student a screwdriver and give them nothing to do with it, there's a very good chance that they're going to carve their initials into that desk. I know because I was the person who carved my initials into the desk. <laughs> if I don't know anything to do with it and I'm bored, I'm, I'm going to, you know, but if you give somebody a tool and you show how to use it, when to use it, um, then it's then you empowered them to do something with that tool <clears throat> and not just surf Facebook, YouTube. Those well, you things. know what, because you're absolutely right. I mean, they're, they're trying to figure out how to solve a problem and I don't know it. I'm, I'm looking on YouTube and stuff, but I think maybe, you know, if, if you are doing that in the shop, make sure they, you, that your peers know that's what you're doing. Hey, I'm, yeah. I'm checking this out right now because the assumption might be you're on TikTok or something and, and that's probably not the place to go to learn things. But if, but to your point there, it's, it's part of your toolbox. And if you're looking something up to say, Hey guys, I'm going to check this out real quick or whatever, but the, uh, and I think it's, 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 it's so hard to fight the pattern. So I think it's both ways, you know, digital native folks who experience the world through their phone, recognizing that, you know, modulated in the workplace, employers recognizing that's how they roll. And as long as they're using it for productive and work kind of things, don't go the extreme and ban it because you're probably going to lose the employee too because they don't want to be working in some draconian place that doesn't let them have their phone. <laughs> well, and if, if, you're one of, if, if you're one of those young techs, put yourself in the, the seat of the shop manager, right? It's probably more uncertainty of not knowing what you're doing on the phone. Mm -hmm. And if you can have conversations with them of, hey, look, I look at this forum or I, I go to this uh, on my phone, have an explanation, have a talk. Now, if it's excessive, that is pretty clear, but uh, be be transparent with what you're doing on your phone because if if you take away maybe some of that uncertainty from the manager's standpoint, I think it, it drives a little bit better conversation and, and maybe builds a little bit of trust too. Yeah. You might be able to flip the script and literally ask their opinion because most experienced techs have their go-to people to, to do that same stuff and you'd say, hey, who, who, should, who should I go to or who should I follow and stuff? And well, that way and you're engaging them. I want to go back to we we deal with in this industry very often that the the older folks who the seasoned folks, um, you know, there's a there's a sentiment of well I learned all of these tips and tricks the hard way so I don't want to help you, and a lot of shops experience that a lot of young technicians experience. So how do you change that perspective? How do you encourage? the more seasoned folks to take you under their wing and want to teach you. And I, I will say that if you're going to the internet for your answers to questions, instead of going to them, they're going to feel insulted. They're going to feel disrespected and they're less inclined to help you. On that same note, I learned this one the hard way when I first started out at my job. We didn't have YouTube and Google and whatever, all that stuff back then, because I'm old. But, um, but if you are going to ask a very seasoned tech um, for advice on something, and then you don't follow it, they yeah. will be incredibly insulted and are very much less likely to give you advice in the future. Mm -hmm. that, well, that, that plays into the humility. I, I remember, I think it was reading some of the applications for last year's Best Young Tech Award and, and right. talking about that tension where I may have just come out of a training program where I actually do have some I, I i know this new technology and stuff and the the person who's been in the shop longer is telling me to do it a certain way and it's that humility part recognizing what bogey's talking about of yeah you may actually know it but you know 
don't diss them by not doing it their way or, you know, let them leave the room and then do it your way, you know. But, well, but, just don't uh, ask just them to... for the advice. If you know the thing, mm. don't ask mm. them and then not follow their advice. If you don't mm. ask them and you go do your thing, then if you mess up, it's on you, right? And if you win, it's on you. But if you've asked somebody for advice, how do I do this? And they tell you, and then either you don't follow it or you go to the next person and ask them the uh. same question, they're insulted, their egos are hurt, because there's a lot of ego in this industry. So their egos are hurt and they're less likely to want to help you. So I think we need to uh we need to start making it okay to ask our our other techs. And I, again, I, I think it's so much easier to go and grab your phone and look online because you can get a fast answer and it's instant gratification. Um but you know let's start let's start making it a regular thing that you can check in with technicians next to you um i know for me i i still turn wrenches and i work out of a single bay garage so i don't have anybody else to turn to but i reach out and i have my group of guys that you know, most of them are the trained by tech guys i'll call them up uh, rich falco has been helping me um trying to get my my head wrapped around why i'm not getting a good scope pack um capture uh Bogie, you you had a good one about you know asking and following what was given to you I, i'd like to take another step further and make sure you know what you are asking not a generic hey i need help with breaks kind of question because nobody has time to walk you through a breaks job but if you go over them be like i don't mm -hmm. understand this caliper is not pressing in i'm trying um i don't know what it is this you know honda is beating my my backside um a technician another technician may go hey look at the book you need to turn that piston not squeeze that piston that's a specific question with a specific answer, not, hey, I need help on brakes. That's too generic. And if I'm running against the clock, I can't stop and teach you brakes right then and there. Anthony, I think that's a really good point. And I think a lot of times it's due to lack of confidence in a young person, right? So that, that person, even to ask a question, it's not the most natural thing for, for a, maybe a young tech to go over to that veteran tech who may or may not be the nicest person in the world. You'd, you'd never know, but, uh, or they haven't earned the respect of that technician yet. So they go over and they're kind of muttering the question and they're not really confident in what <clears> they're asking because they don't want to get yelled at or they don't want to seem stupid when they ask the question, right? So, uh, you know, I think for, for those mentors that are out there, those shops that are out there, make sure they're comfortable asking the question, make it, make it easy for them to ask the question. And then for those young techs, just make sure you think it through before you ask the question. Don't just go and, and ask a question that's off the cuff, like actually think it through and show that you thought it through because you're, again, you're going to get more respect when you do go ask that question. Absolutely. As, as a senior tech, when I was in a, in a shop as a senior tech, uh, I want to see that you've tried it first. Yeah. Right. Like, don't, mm -hmm. don't just pull the car in and say, how do I do this? Mm -hmm. Right. I want to see like, well, what have you tried first? Those are always my first questions. What have you tried? What have you done? Because I want to know that you're invested in this and that you ha have actually legitimately come up against a wall where your experience isn't going to let you find the solution. And I need to lend mine to you now. Mm hmm. Yeah, so true. So true. Um, okay, that was great. I feel like I have a good understanding of, you know, when you first start at a school, now when you're first starting. So now then the next one is promotions. So I think this panel might have a few different <clears throat> opinions on this, but you know, I often hear starting out being on the Lubrax, maybe not the most glamorous, and a lot of people want to do diagnostics. So just what are your thoughts on, you know, getting on that promotion track and how they can really sort of, you know, move up the ladder, so to speak, um, in the shop? So, Anthony, I, I had you kind of as the one who might start us for this one. So what are your thoughts? Um, I think this also goes back to some of our first conversations. When you're looking for a shop, look for a shop that has a pathway. Uh, mm -hmm. Right now inside the training field, we have a lot of customers that come and go. Um, they want to buy our training packages, um, but if they don't have a set training program in place to implement that, to have a structure so that the technicians know what to do and where it leads, um, then it's just it's it's like offering a library, but not ever teaching anybody how to read. Um, you can have all the information, and and we do have that. Uh, we live in an age right now that anything you need to do, you can find on the internet. 
I mean, you don't have to pay for subscriptions for anything. You can find the information if you're willing to dig down and do the put in the, the work to find it. Um, but when you're looking for a shop, if you have a shop that already lays it out for you and says, hey, here's the structure. Here's here's an estimate of how long it takes in each of these pathways and each of these spots. And here's how you promote. Um, that's that's number one, first and foremost, for every new technician out there. Find shops that are willing to train. If you if you go to just a shop that's hiring, it's it's run down, it's dirty, it's grungy, and it looks like it's out of 1979. Sorry if that offends some of you guys that have worked in 1979. Too young, thank God. But if it reminds you of that 1979's garage, um, maybe take a step back and look at it and go, hey, are they <clears> – <throat> being prosperous are they growing as a shop are they on the cutting edge of the industry or am i attaching my myself to something that's already getting outdated and being pushed out interesting mm -hmm. i would um, go back oh sorry go ahead bogey. no no go ahead Jay. well i would go back to something that that bogey had mentioned earlier in that when you're going through the interview process with the shop, it's as much you interviewing the shop as the shop interviewing you. Mm -hmm. You can set really good groundwork for yourself if you're asking those questions in the interview stage up front. What is your career pathing look like? What is it? What's your training? Uh, do you pay for training? Right? Like, do you pay for my time when I go to training? You know, asking those questions up front are great, and then being able to kind of get an idea as to how they're going to check in, right? Are, are you checking in once a year? Are you checking in quarterly? Do we have weekly meetings where we're talking about uh, my career progression and where I wanna go? Uh, one thing that I tell a lot of shops or, or advise a lot of shops in terms of communication with a technician is painting a vision for that, that especially that young technician that has aspirations past where they're at. Make sure that they know that, hey, maybe the shop looks this way today, but that's not the plan down the road. We're going to have additional positions. And with the evolution of the automotive business in general, there's probably going to be some different opportunities coming down the road. So uh, being able to kind of paint that vision for that young tech. But if you're in that, that young tech seat, set the foundation at the interview. Ask those questions. Be prepared when you go into that interview to ask about training and career pathing because it's really vital to your career. And, you know, it's funny how all of this kind of circles together or circles back where, you know, we were talking about when you ask those questions, it just, it, it helps set everything else up and it helps make you a better technician. And if they don't have that, but they're offering two bucks an hour more, you might want to go to like, look at that shop that's paying $2 an hour less because they're going to put you through a good path. They're going to put you on the right track uh, for the, to be the most successful in your career. That, that's probably one of the most common things I hear about people who actually leave the field is, and, and this would be interesting to get, get the gang's feedback on, like how long is it reasonable for? So we know Gen Z wants to get it quick. They don't want to be working on loo wraps, sweep, sweep of floors for, for a year or two. And then I hear uh, veteran folks saying, you've got to pay your dues. It's almost like got to be hazed, you know, and they're, there's, they're somewhere <laughs> in the middle. But I, I, I've, I've heard that I've more frequently heard, you know, and, and some of the ones, hopefully they found another shop that does empower them and, and puts them on that path. But I, I've heard it quite a few times. You know, I, I paid for that education. I didn't pay to be on the rack for two years, you know, whatever it is. But I don't know what's a normal, but I think it, it's a real point well taken that at least have that conversation, because if they're going to tell you here, you got to do that for two years, maybe you don't want to do that. Or here you got to do it six months. Maybe that's more appealing. I don't know. Well, I think I think the time frame depends on you as a young tech, right? Yes, nobody gets into this industry to be a loop tech. I get it, right? Um, we want to advance. We want to be a master tech. We want to be an electrical diagnostic whiz. Like, I totally get that. And I'm not going to say that any tech deserves to be hazed in Mike's words, because we don't. However, there is a certain there is a certain amount of paying your dues. You're you're the newbie. You're low person on the totem pole and and i need as a as a boss i need to see that you're willing to put your all into whatever you're doing so if 
if you're emptying garbages and sweeping floors and filling the technicians coolant jugs and brake clean jugs or whatever the case may be if you're jumping in and want to be helpful be the best at that that you can possibly be and when i see that as a boss i'm going to want to promote you if you're a loop tech be the best loop tech show that you can run circles around the other kids show that you're a natural leader and you're helping the other kids as you learn more right show yourself to be worthy of a promotion. And then when you feel like you truly are, when you feel like you've earned it, like you have shown yourself in the best way possible, don't be afraid to ask for it. Right? A lot of shops, no matter how big or small, they see that you're excelling in that thing that you're doing. They want to keep you in that thing because why lose somebody who's doing a really great job there? So it is a-okay to say, hey, I, I think that I've earned this. I've proven myself. Um, I, I want to talk to you about promotion and when I might be able to move into more diagnostic and more like, or let's not skip general repair, right? Because if you're going from lube tech, you're not going to go straight to diagnostics. You're going to go lube tech, general repair, and then diagnostics. And that's part of, of learning. Take advantage of that lube tech position. You're getting to inspect the vehicle. You're looking at everything on that car. And if as a boss, I see that not only are you doing a great job at oil changes, but you're coming back with a thorough inspection and you're seeing things, that tells me everything I need to know. Mm -hmm. If you're just putting it through with the rubber stamp, I don't want to put you on general repair because you're going to you're gonna miss things. You're going to miss important things. So I love be that. The best. Be the best. I yeah. love that. And, and encouraging patience in young techs as well, right? They're like. You, it does take time to earn your stripes and the respect of others a little bit, but you can learn on a lube rack. I think a lot of times we underestimate how much you can learn on a lube rack. And, and if you have patience and truly are trying to perform really well at that, that task and, and what you're doing, it, it's, you're doing yourself a favor for the long run. But uh, that's something I see as maybe a, a common issue with, with younger techs is they're just not patient, right? They want to go to the next thing really fast. And, it's the next job. It's the next uh, next promotion. It's you know more money. All of this stuff. But if they can just slow down and say, "Hey, listen, you're 23 years old. Chill out. You got a long time to go in your career. Like, just take it easy. You're you, you're fine." Yeah, and it's really easy to fall back on. I hear this a lot. To fall back on like, "Oh, well, they just don't like young people, or they don't like me because of the color of my skin, or they don't like me because of my gender." And while I don't want to take away from the fact that those are legitimate things, sometimes, right? There are shops that really do discriminate in various ways. However, know the difference between genuine, genuine, genuine <laughs> bias, um, and and just you're new, right? You're right. new. You're going to empty garbage cans. You're going to sweep the floor. Like that's part of it. I started out that way. We all Same started. Here. And I also know when I started out doing that, I hated it too. And I thought that they were treating me differently because I was a girl until the next tech came in and had to do the same thing. And, and he was a guy. I'm like, oh, this is just the new person thing. This, is, <laughs> this isn't me. <laughs> right? So you like, guys yeah. put that in check. Yeah. You guys, you guys touch on, on, on some good aspects that I want. I want to dig in a little bit further on a concept I think that's missing. And it's the idea that the more prestige, the more respect you get, it's at the next level. It's always at the next level. So you always want to promote, um, but in fact, something that I think is really missing in our industry from the customer and from ourselves knowing inside that person on the lube rack is very important. Like oh. the, the idea of the technician, none of us go into a surgery and ask the doctor for like the cheapest. I want the cheapest doctor. Do you have any coupons, doctor? You know, like <laughs> you're going to open up my heart. I get it. It's a lot of work. But can we can we talk about the price a little bit? But, you know, it's. It, let take that back to a second and, and you get on the lube rack isn't always the regular customers the lube rack may have your coupon clippers the people that are just trying to get the cheapest oil change possible but in that moment when they are getting their oil change you may be the only set of eyes that have looked underneath that car and that driver that that mother that father that grandmother those children those car seats in the back that is your responsibility when you are on that rack. You may be the only eyes that are underneath that car. You may be the one who catches that, hey, you've got a tie rod going out here. That tie rod goes, this wheel's going to flip in, and if you're doing 75 when it happens, you're going to crash with your kids in the car. 
that's a very important person inside the shop because that person may see more customers' cars than all your other techs because he goes Preach through it. them quickly. And <laughs> yeah, wow. know, yeah. Yeah. Knowing, knowing that, knowing inside that that is what you're worth, like not even mm -hmm. just from the customers that know when you come into our field, when you come to be a technician, that you are coming to take care of people. You are keeping them safe and you may be the only person that is going to be able to help them in that situation at that time. If you go into your job like that, the rest of it will come. Just go in there knowing that you're there to take care of people. Amen. 100%. <laughs> yes. Love that. Yeah, that, that's great. You know, it's so true. Um, just hearing you say that, yeah, woo, uh, reminded me of this young lady that I was speaking with last week. And she was very, very new in her career um, at this conference. And she was just so lovely. But, you know, there have been some challenges, right? And she described a few of them. And some, most of them were with difficult customers. And, you know, at the end of it, I thought she was going to just be kind of like, oh, man, so I'm having a really hard time. But she didn't. She said, but you know what? Every day I just remember that I'm doing a really important job and I'm keeping my customers safe on the road. I'm keeping them safe, just what, like you said, safe with their families, safe going to work, safe getting their kids to school. And I mean, she couldn't have been more than 23. And I was like, that's like, that's amazing. You know, she's, she's dealing with all this other crap, but she's always keeping this in her mind. And that is what's driving her and pushing her and she loves it. She loves the industry and it keeps her going. So that's perspective. That's really, mm -hmm. really, I mean, it's so awesome to hear somebody even talk about that and, and really have that perspective because a lot of times I think when we look at message boards and we look at different things, we don't hear that message. Right. And mm -hmm. I, uh, I really pumped to hear that just because it's, it's a, maybe a different narrative than we're used to hearing. Mm -hmm. Right, it's, exactly. It's, it's number one. I, I couldn't say it any better than Anthony. It, it is absolutely the most crucial thing. We exist to serve our customers and keep them safe and to treat every car like it is your great grandmother who you love to pieces. Would you want her driving in this car? Do you personally want to be driving next to this car? <laughs> this, yeah. That this is people's lives in our hands. And if you don't take that seriously, you know, I, I fired somebody once because he had a comeback that was a brake line that had been rubbed through and it came this close to not having brakes and causing a major accident. And when I showed it to him, he looked and said, oh, that sucks and walked away. <laughs> and I'm like, this didn't like totally eat you up inside. If I had done that, I would be horrified at myself mm. that's somebody's life and he was nonchalant about it but you can't be nonchalant about this no. this is people's yeah. lives right yep exactly okay so before i move on i do want to just read this one comment here from mike's automotive diagnostics so he says i have something to say about getting promoted during your downtime ask permission to shadow a tech i yes. know that when i was a supervisor i would promote those who have shown initiative I think that's a good piece of advice. That's a great comment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It goes in line with what Anthony said. I don't necessarily think it's always grabbing a broom, but it's there is no such thing as downtime. There is mm -hmm. no such thing. I want to see that you're jumping up and ready to help with whatever, and you're asking questions. And it's that stay curious thing. If you have nothing else to do, do not just hold your toolbox down. Go over to the tech that you admire and respect. And say, what are you working on? Can I watch you? Are you okay with me just hanging out and watching you? Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as downtime. Absolutely. I would push, I would push okay, back so on just one, shadowing. I would push back, mm -hmm. push back a little bit on just shadowing because shadowing can be just as much of a waste of time if you don't go into it with a purpose. Um, one of the things that I want to okay. start pushing out this year is a have a checklist. You, you, you know what needs to be done on breaks. There's a checklist that you can follow. Grab that checklist and being able to watch and monitor another technician complete that job while being able to mark off like, okay, yep, he did do all of these things and be able to go, hey, I didn't see you do whatever. Hey, I, did, I noticed that you took your air ratchet or your electric ratchet and you, you ran these down, but I didn't see you torque them. Maybe then the, the technician can go, oh, hey, this is a new tool that I just spent my life savings on from Snap-on. That's an electric wrench and a torque wrench in it and show them, hey, you just learned there's a cool new tool. That technician said, hey, man, you were watching close enough to 
you know, potentially see that I missed something or if they do miss something, you know, like, hey, I noticed you lubed the back of those brakes. I was looking at your at your, you know, computer, your 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 you have motor logic up and it says that this one doesn't use lube. Is there a reason why you lubed it? And, you know, maybe they, they share with you, hey, the the box said to lube it. Moto logic said not to lube it. I made a choice on one or the other or, hey, dang it. I shouldn't have lubed that one. Man, I got in too much of a hurry. Let me pull it off. Let me clean it back up. Let me do it right. Now you have the new guy that just caught a mistake in a veteran, and that veteran's going to go, dang, he's watching closely. Um, that can backfire because, as Bogey said earlier, there's a or, lot of go yeah. in the field. Um, so just, make sure that you have that room. Go ahead, Bogey. Just be real careful with how you do that. Frame it as a question. Hey, I'm curious. Is there, and in school they taught me, or I, you know, I see some techs do this and some techs do that. Is there a reason why you like to do it this way, right? Absolutely. If you come in with, why didn't you twerk that? You're gonna make an enemy and they are never helping you with anything. Yes. Who is this That's, young punk yeah. telling me how to do my job? So I, the reason why I say just shadow initially is because you're building relationship with that technician. You don't want to irritate them. You don't want to be there to, to keep them from making their money and their paycheck. So ask them if you can shadow. As you build that relationship, then it becomes asking questions. But remember, you're asking questions of a veteran. Be careful how you phrase them. They likely know more than you. <laughs> <laughs> and so just be careful. If you frame things as a question, you'll never go wrong. But be humble. Even if you think you know the right answer, be humble when you ask it. Hey, I'm curious why you. Some people do this, some people do that. Well, and I, I like think that I ask the question. I think, yeah, and I think mentorship is such a key thing, but oftentimes in a shop, there's not like, hey, you have this mentor, right? Uh, you know, I, I don't think shops do a great job at that yet where they're assigning mentors, or if they do, they're assigning maybe the wrong mentor to somebody. But look at it from a, if you're a young tech, you're trying to almost, uh, you're trying to develop a mentor, right? Like you're trying to really, it might not be in words that like, Hey, Frank's your, Frank's your mentor. But if it, if you really respect Frank and, and you really like what he does, you know, be curious as Bogey was saying and ask those questions and you're almost developing your own mentor. Don't, don't leave it up to somebody else really kind of take the reins on that. And it, by being curious and asking good questions and being respectful, uh, you, you can almost grow your own mentor. Yeah. And it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship, right? Like yeah. earn, earn your keep, so to speak. If you have someone who's willing to share their knowledge and willing to take their time and stop making money for 10, 15, 20 minutes so that they can help you, help them make that time back up. When they have uh, axle grease everywhere on a car, volunteer to clean it up for them. Take those belly pans and clean them up for them they're going to take time out of their day to help you take time out of your day so that there is that symbiotic relationship that give and take make yourself valuable to them yes and they will take care of you that mm -hmm. is awesome bogey i think that's one of the hard things to always remember is time is money especially in the shop right. um jay i would even i would i would say one more thing when choosing or looking at a mentor you don't have to go get the highest most seasoned vet in the shop Yes. Go next level up. So if you're a brand new tech, go find a C tech, and they're going to be a lot more. They're going to be a lot closer to your develop you developmentally, and they're going to remember what it was like to be in your shoes more recently, as opposed to the guy who's been there 35, 45 years. <laughs> um, they may have a lot of knowledge, but sometimes they've forgotten how they got there. Um, so you know, choose somebody that's, a little bit closer. That's great advice. And th the one thing I would add there is make sure that person you choose is respected in the shop and that they they have a good attitude right i've seen more than one young tech get under uh maybe a pretty negative tech and that negative tech has a pretty bad influence on that young person and so when when you're looking at who who to follow make sure they're respected make sure that they have the qualities that you're looking for and uh because if you get under somebody that's not you know as, as pessimistic and everything's negative guess what you're going to become pretty negative so make sure who you're following is the person you want to be yeah 
Absolutely. Okay, so I want to move on to talk about some of the challenges. I think we have established that the ego of the other techs might be a challenge. So we've got that one. Um, but what are some other possible challenges that these new young techs might face, you know, when they're first starting out? And most importantly for this discussion today is what are some tips for overcoming those? So, Mike, I'd love to start with you on this one. A couple things come to mind, and, and it's funny, we do the great segues, you know, time is money. So speed. You know, you're new, you don't necessarily have the experience, but the shop, you know, they need to move vehicles through the bays and stuff. So that pressure for speed, particularly on that on that first job where you may not have that experience. Um, and, and so, and, and I'm sure my esteemed colleagues here can add more to this, but, you know, skill up, practice, get the advanced certifications, take the initiative to go learn these things, ask about tips for speed that that guy I mentioned earlier who didn't make it in the bays that I'm sure that was part of the deal he just wasn't technically dead so he couldn't go fast uh, so I think it, and but then balancing that with the very important thing we were talking about that these you are potentially saving somebody's life you can't cut corners so that balance between the speed and doing a hundred percent spot-on quality job it comes with time and practice they know you don't have that yet but you know there there are t trips, tips and tricks that folks have learned around the shop over the years that they can teach you that you're not get not get on an online course or in a classroom. So that's that's one of them. Um, another uh, I've heard folks talk about is isolation. Um, I, mean, I think Bogie and I've talked about it in the past too. Maybe being a, a, a the first woman a shop's uh, hired, but it can also be just the the first new green person. And I think it's really important that what Bogie was talking about earlier, some of that that stuff that, that the newbie has to do is regardless of your race and gender and stuff, but still nonetheless, folks can feel isolated. Um, you know, there's nobody else my age here. There's, you know, everybody else has been here 10, 15 years kind of stuff. Uh, so a, a couple of potential suggestions there, you know, find a friend in the shop, you know, befriend somebody that might be able to take you under their wing and stuff. Maybe he's not the official mentor, but maybe somebody that knows the ropes. Uh, Gen Z is digitally native. Um, there's, there's online communities. We, we created jointechforce.org for that reason. There's thousands of Gen Z techs and students in there that are sharing ideas and tips and things. And, you know, somebody might, you know, post something like, oh, this happened to me. Like, you know what, that, that actually happens everywhere. It's not just you, you know, being targeted. Uh, and but then also maybe, you know, through those communities, learning about things that they can bring back to the shop. Um, mm -hmm. We've we've talked about this already, but just to reinforce work is hard. You know, you are going to have to pay your dues. But even when you're done paying your dues, it's still, you know, you got to do the work. You can't just step in and, and be running the shop and be a master tech. It, it takes skill and experience and training. Um, another challenge, and this is by no means all over the place but you know if we're talking about a challenge that you might encounter a negative shop environment you know just like the example i gave earlier you know yeah. same business same brand different leadership um you know and and so to you know stay positive though don't don't lower yourself to that level but if you ultimately ascertain that this is just a, ne a negative environment and it's not me find that place that that you will you will be rewarded and praised and, and trained and all that kind of stuff because uh, mm -hmm. it and, is out there you just might need to you know look a little bit but don't give up it's out there yeah and, and i mean and it, it, I there's five jobs to every one tech out there right now you can right. find a, a positive <laughs> place if you look <laughs> right and it, it sometimes is a fine line between what is normal what's everywhere and and what is a, a negative work environment and that's where connecting with your community connecting with other apprentices um, as a woman particularly or any minority within the field i would say definitely connecting with others as your litmus test like hey is this just me is this my shop but also knowing where your personal boundary is of what is acceptable behavior for you and what's going to limit your ability to grow uh, and, and to be in a safe environment. I will say one of the things that you can do to deal with Mike's original point about time, um, mm -hmm. when you're interviewing shops, this kind of goes back to like, set yourself up for success from the get-go. Uh, I would not, as a brand new tech, want to work at a shop that is putting me on flat rate right away. Right. Okay. That, is, that is not acceptable. A shop that wants you to put you on flat rate right, right away is setting you up to fail. It's going to encourage you to cut corners. It's going to take away from your ability to learn. I don't want you rushing right now. 
If it takes you four hours to do a brake job, I don't care because I want you to do it right and I want you to get really comfortable with it. So if that's your number one red flag about a not positive work environment, if they want to put you on flat rate right away, run run away. <laughs> hey, Bogey, for the, for the viewers that might not know flat rate, maybe they're really early in their career. What, what is that about? So flat rate basically is the concept that I get paid for the job, but not for how long it takes me. So if a break job pays two hours and I do it in an hour and a half, I just made an extra half an hour out of nowhere. If it takes me three hours, I lost an hour. So a, a really good tech, you know, can be making 15, 16 hours in an eight hour day, right? If they're really good, but they've earned that, they've learned the shortcuts, they recognize the problems, they hear a noise and they know what it is, or at least know where to go and confirm it really quickly. Versus when you're brand new, you're, you're gonna be slower because this is all relatively new to you and I want you to be slower. If you're beaten flat rate time right off the gate, I'm really concerned. Yes. <laughs> yeah, 100. Yep. I agree. I agree. Uh, one thing I would add there, you know, just when we look at young techs, maybe the, the biggest reason for failure that I see in a, a really young tech is when they lose confidence. And so it, it, losing confidence in this industry can just eat you alive. I was guilty of that, right? Like, as a young tech, when you lose that confidence, it's really hard to get it back because you're beating yourself up. You're putting a lot of pressure on yourself. And maybe you are looking at book time when maybe you shouldn't necessarily be looking at book time. And, and it, it really eats you alive. And so when I look at a young tech, one of the most important things to me is that they're growing confidence and they can grow confidence by doing training. They can grow confidence by getting a mentor. They can grow confidence by just getting better at what they're doing every day. And if you can keep your head down and stay really hyper-focused on what it is that you're doing and what your objectives are, you're going to grow that confidence. And, and it is so fun to see the light switch go on with a young tech when they finally hit, you know, that level of confidence to where they feel, they feel good about going in and doing jobs. And, and it, it's a different job when they feel good about it. Right. It, it's a, uh, it's fun when you can do it really well. But if you if you don't grow that confidence, it's really hard to catch up. It's really hard to get that back. So uh, if you're proactive and doing those things that can help build confidence every day, you know, it's it's something that compounds every day. You're 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 studying, you're learning. What I see in the best texts is they're not even just relying on the shops training. They're going out and they're reading forums at night. They're they're doing their research. And that's all stuff that can build a foundation of knowledge that helps you build that confidence. And I think that's so important for young people to really, really grasp that and understand that. Yeah. Can I, can I jump off on that too? Cause I think you made a really good point there, Jay, like mistakes are where we learn, right? This is where we learn the most. If I hear about a mistake, I may kind of remember it, but if I make the mistake, I am never doing that again. That is how I learn the best. And I think as a culture, we have a really hard time, not just in the automotive industry, but as a whole with, mm -hmm. with failure, with mistakes and young techs. And I've seen it particularly amongst women, this like, I've messed up, I'm awful. I'm never gonna succeed. I should just give up now. And there's that confidence, knock, 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 right? Coming yeah. down. So for the shop owners and the, the, the more, um, experienced technicians that are out there, make sure you're creating an environment where mistakes are, are almost celebrated and the learning that's implicit in them. And for the young techs out there, when you make a mistake, like, first of all, raise your hand that you've made a mistake. But if you come to me and said, I made a mistake, what I learned was, Right. Mm -hmm. I have I have no problem paying for a mistake as long as there was learning involved. If you didn't take anything away from that, that's a problem, right? If you're just making mistakes and not learning anything, we have a problem. But if you're making mistakes and you're like, I just broke a bolt off and now I learned how to get a bolt out of a cylinder. <laughs> and it sucks. <laughs> right? It totally sucks, but I learned, right? Yeah. And now I know how to use a drill and I know I know how to do a tap and die or a time cert or whatever it is that you learn, a thread cert. 
learn from it, but, but don't beat yourself up. Like you're gonna make mistakes. Mm -hmm. I have 22 years of experience as a technician. I still make mistakes. And when I'm working with newbies, they ask me all the time, like, how did you get so good at, at fixing all of our mistakes that we make all the time? I'm like, cause I've made them all. <laughs> I've made all of those mistakes and I had to learn how to fix them. So get excited right. about them. And folks that are in management positions or the elder sh technicians in the shop that are maybe watching this, like, don't beat them up for this. They're kids, they're new. Yes. And I, Bogey J, you guys hit on a very good one. And I think all of us still make mistakes. Um, there's there's two Falcos that come to mind. The first one's from the movie Replacements. Uh, when he talks about what is he afraid of? And he says, I'm afraid of quicksand. Um, when you do make a mistake and it hurts your confidence, it's real easy then to follow with another mistake, another mistake. And next thing you know, everything's spiraling. Your whole day's going down the drain. Um, and that that can be the scariest part for any technician when you start second guessing yourself. Again, turning re year, turning wrenches for God, two decades now. Man, I don't qualify for young tech anymore. Um, <laughs> I still playing in the diagnostic field and I'm like, okay, I know how these things work. I know how they're going. And right now I've got one that's kicking my butt and brings me to my next Falco. I reach out to Rich Falco and I said, hey, all right, I'm trying. I've got my Pico. I've got my stuff set up. I've got, I've, I've got my code set criteria. I know what it's supposed to look like. I know what I'm supposed to see, but I'm not seeing it. And I jumped the gun and I replaced two sensors that were not the problem. I ate $150 worth of sensors. And I'm going, stop, stop, stop. Take a breath walk away regroup and come back because if you continue on that spiral it'll kill you and and be yeah. be willing to reach out to to somebody your friend your mentor somebody in the shop somebody you respect and go hey i'm i'm screwing up left and right i can't i can't seem to see the sky anymore i don't know which way i'm turning anymore and let somebody's fresh eyes take a look and and give you a hand give you a give you an out yeah Absolutely. All right. We have about three minutes left here. And I just want to quickly, I really want to touch on this soft skills piece. So I'm wondering if, if any of you, you know, want to kind of chime in on the soft skills that these techs need, because, you know, I'm seeing more and more nowadays, they're, they're coming out from the back, you know, and they're talking to the customers. So that maybe wasn't the case, you know, 20 years ago, but what soft skills can these technicians really work on that might help them in their new jobs? I mean, I feel like most of what we've talked about thus far is soft skills, realistically. Like very little of what we have said is actually about turning wrenches or diagnosing vehicles. This is, it is all soft skills. Surviving in any job environment, excelling in any career is soft skills. Knowing how to speak to people, knowing how to write a story, right? When you're writing, especially in dealership life, how you write it up, determines how much money you're going to make. If you if you just say replaced engine, you're going to make this much money. But when you go through all of the things that you did, right? But it it really comes back to at the end of the day remembering that point that Anthony made of you have people's lives in your hands. If you don't like people, and I understand a lot of techs get it like get into it because they can work just with cars and cars don't talk back. But you really actually do need to care about people and like them because people drive cars, right? <laughs> and you're going to interact with people, whether it's other techs or it's customers. It's remembering that their lives are in your hands and they don't know. I hear techs a lot complain about like these stupid customers, right? Of course they don't know. They're not technicians. If they knew, you wouldn't have a job. So <laughs> yeah. like be patient, be calm, understand that people don't know things. And when people don't know things, it's an opportunity for us to be their hero. It's an opportunity for us to educate them and help them understand this crazy spaceship that they drive around every day. Right? The, the soft skills, it comes down to liking people <laughs> right? really and, and wanting to communicate with them. When I, I think, think on that good communication, that. <laughs> you, you think about when, when, when a job's done, yeah, the, most of the customers don't know what you're talking about. But when you take the time to educate them, I can't tell you how many times the people in my family who don't know that stuff come back and like, 
well, they actually explained it to me and I got it. They didn't, they didn't talk to me like I was stupid and should know this stuff. They took the time to say, well, this is how this works. And this, and you know, and this, we had to fix this because if we didn't, then this thing triggered, you know, and, and just taking that time, I'm, you know, beyond just the write-up, but just having that conversation about and, and letting them know, I mean, I don't think it's an act. I, a lot of techs I talk to are, are driven by the fact that they're, they're, they're helping. They're solving people's problems. They're potentially saving lives. And that comes across authentically when you're explaining to your customer why you're doing this or why this should be done. And, and it's really appreciated. It can't be an act. Like people will see yeah. through it. Right. People will see if you're not authentic. So really curiosity and, and enthusiasm for what you do and getting excited about the fact that you're taking care of people, that's all the soft, soft skills that I need from somebody, right? It has to be authentic though. The one one thing I would add there before we're finished is mm -hmm. so many, uh, so much of industry wants to change the perception of the industry. Technicians want more respect, shops want more respect. And as our labor rates continue to increase, I think it's really imperative that we do that. But to me, what moves us into a different level of, of respect amongst the general public are the soft skills. And that's what's going to get you paid more. That's what's going to get you more respect. That's what's going to take you to a whole new level because so many techs are so good, so talented at what they do, but aren't good at explaining what they're doing. So they're not, they can't explain it to general people and to the general population. And so those soft skills help you do that. They help you communicate. And I think that's what's going to start putting us in and really creating that paradigm shift for the outside world to understand how talented you people are is is when you create or when you really develop those soft skills uh, that's what moves us into a different direction mm -hmm. yeah. yeah absolutely well thank you guys so much you know that was just a great conversation i know i learned a lot um, I really appreciate you guys taking the time to chat with us. And I do want to take a few more moments here. Any of you, again, who are 35 or younger or who are watching and who know someone who's 35 and younger and who's an automotive technician, who's just, you know, excelling, doing great work, exhibiting all these wonderful qualities we've talked about today, please uh, nominate them for our Bus Young Tech Award. So you can see the website there just vehicleservicepros.com slash 2022 best young tech nominations are open as of today. So please check that out. There's some really great prizes too that come with that, including, um, you know, a trip to apex and some free tools, which is always nice to, to get started in the career. So check that out. Um, and of course this award and this uh, panel today would not be possible without the help from our sponsors for the best young tech award. So we have Carter, Autolite, Fram, CarQuest Technical Institute, and Worldpack Training Institute as marquee sponsors. And we also have Autel and TechForce Foundation as supporting sponsors. So thank you to our sponsors and thank you to the panelists and to all of you watching. You know, I hope that you gained some valuable advice from this session and are motivated to keep growing and staying in this wonderful auto repair industry. So thank you so much for joining us, everyone. And Thank you.